Yeah. Okay, we are recording. Crispian, how are you today? I'm fine. Oh, well, a bit of tonsillitis, but apart from that, I'm all good. Good, good. Constant good. grumble. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's nice to nice to have you on today. And thank uh, you for having me. And a absolute pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Um, before we sort of you know start sort of looking back and 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 chatting about some of the songs that have been really sort of important uh, throughout your your life and creative journey, um, I always like to start the podcast. Uh, Crispin, by asking artists to tell me the song that they regard as having the greatest ever intro. Yes, it's a good question because the uh, intros are are definitely an art, and they um, they are they're not accidental. They're crafted and they're considered, and um, you know it goes it goes back to the uh, to the dawn of of composition. So you've got quite a lot to choose from. But for me, the experience that I had with the greatest um, intro, and certainly I would say this is up there with Beethoven and some of the greats, is the intro to Smoke on the Water. <laughs> because it, um, it's so simple. And it, it's so good, and it just keeps on going round and round and round in a in a circle. The first version that I ever heard of "Smoke on the Water" was when I was, um, I'd say, eleven or twelve. You know, when you're at your most susceptible, and the first impressions go very deep. In fact, I think you take them with you your whole life. Absolutely. And um, the the uh, the first version was was played to me by a kid called Ben Castle, who's actually the son of Roy Castle. And he was already a, a brilliant, brilliant musician at that time. He was a bit of a prodigy at 11 or 12. He was um, amazing jazz saxophonist. Is that how old you would have been at that time? Sorry? Is that how old you would have been at that time? Yeah, so I was 11, we were both 11, 12. And he, he was into really sort of avant-garde jazz, you know, he was a very curious, eccentric kid. And he was into, the, he would... Walk, I was at a boarding school and he would go home and watch the young ones and come back and tell us, you know, what was going on on TV. Yeah. And anyway, he, he turned me on to this band called Deep Purple and, um, and he, he played me uh, Deep Purple live in Japan, which I think is a, is a common theme amongst people who get into rock music early on is that they hear that album and it changes their, their whole, they get, they get the hit of, of 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 British rock, yeah. <laughs> and and the, it, and actually the live in Japan is is it's more exciting than than Machine Head than the studio version, and they all have a, a little bit of a play and the tempo and the recording is just uh, phenomenal, and it led me to it led me to become really really heavily into Deep Purple at a quite a young age, and I went down to the local record store when I was about about that time in Kingston upon Thames. And there was one of those great indie record stores where there were a lot of goths and a lot of metalheads, a lot of people doing this, you know, which isn't, it used to be everywhere, obviously, it isn't, isn't so, um, so prevalent now. And, um, and I pulled out Deep Purple in Rock, which has their faces on Mount Rushmore. And I said, oh, this looks substantial. <laughs> so I think this must be the one I should get. So I remember walking up, wide-eyed, innocent, to the desk, pushing this this album across the desk, and this slightly advanced in years metalhead looked up, looked at the album, he looked at me and he went, that is a classic album. <laughs> All right, you've been warned, and it, you know he felt like he he was p taking part in my initiation. That is a classic album. Awesome. You go home now, and you know, good luck. So it did it did change my life. It got me into that sound, and um, yeah, it's 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 not only one of the great great intros. It's one of the great rock live recordings, and you know, it's it's scarred many generations now. I want to ask you as, as, as a songwriter and how the way that people listen to music when 
Cooley Shaker first started making music and the ways, the platforms that they'd get it on, which would have been, like you say, the aforementioned indie record stores or your HMVs and things like that and buying it on CD or, or vinyl. And what I've seen uh, is the fact that over the, the, the way that my kids get their music now is that they find it on things like TikTok and Spotify playlists and things like that. And and I guess maybe with more sort of mainstream pop music, it feels that like songs are getting shorter and shorter and shorter to, to kind of cater for rapid moving thumbs that, that seem to have kind of a, a shorter attention span, I guess is where I'm going with this. And and so that's reflective in lots of commercial pop music, you know, songs that literally, I mean, you know, two and a half minutes long and, and things like that. And there is, I mean, that live version of, of, of Smoke and Water, there's no vocal for like a minute and 20. And to, the thought that you take that to a label now, you'd get laughed out the door, which is, you know, which is ridiculous. But in the current sort of climate of pop music, it's all so short. And, and so where I'm going with this question, Chris, is like when you're writing the new Coolie Shaker record, does any of these trends in how people are getting music and, and rather than trying to get on the evening session, now they're trying to get on Spotify playlists and, and it's saturated in, in music so that, you know, you've got to grab them quickly. Does any of that filter through into your creative process? I think you have to feel um like there's you know there's a way of saying what you want to say in four minutes or six minutes or seven minutes and there's a way of saying it in two and a half and actually two and a half can be more of an art if you listen to you know um i should know better or you know any of those early Beatles singles or elvis and you just think wow how did they do that in in two minutes you know that was just that's genius and and I, I i love that i love the single um shape uh but i also love highway star <clears throat> so it all depends what way how you feel and what what kind of um what kind of mood you want to get across i've done both and i, I continue to to do both and the album that we're we've just finished the, the new one which will come out um next year it's more it is more pop in terms of its its structure because we just did a double album called first congregational church of eternal love and free hugs there was some pretty long songs on there so you know i i find you know you tend to kind of you know swing with the pendulum yeah. um according to your mood but also those bands like like deep purple and you know led zeppelin they they'd also they were able to do those short single versions if you want to take the big rock bands sure. who are no, known for doing all of those, you know, sort of epic stairway to heaven type things, you know, they, they had done it. And, you know, Led Zeppelin one is pretty poppy, actually, mm. you know, some pretty poppy com compact tunes there. And so, so, so I think it's horses for courses at the Absolutely. end of the day. I'm going to ask you for track two to tell me the first song that you remember having an emotional impact on you, please emotional impact i mean i'm 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 tempted to go you know because i'm i've answered a lot of these questions that you that you warned me about I, i've answered them truthfully because there's a tent there's a temptation when you go back and you look at your the formative music or influences and you want to think oh right actually it was i was listening to surrealist minimalist yeah <laughs> da uh music from <laughs> st petersburg or whatever but um no, my, I grew up, I grew up, you know, I was born in 73. So really, it was through through the 70s and 80s, early 90s that I was, a, you know, you know, prior to being considered an adult, whatever that means. So I, I tend to look back and think, Oh, yeah, I can see why that was happening. And the first music that I heard that 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 went deep and became a kind of a, a an emotional soundtrack because that is what music is tends to be it, it it's a reflection it's like you we remember the smell of cut grass you know on a summer's afternoon when we were a kid and that takes us back and obviously music is the same thing but it it reflects where you're at emotionally at that time things that you can't put 
quite put into words because you weren't old enough to. And so the music becomes a kind of a mirror into who you were and how you felt. And my mum used to say to me, oh, you know, good night, darling. Would you like me to put some music on it for you? And she used to go down to the, because we lived in a, in a, a Georgian terraced house in between Southall and Hounslow, uh, which is probably why I ended up becoming very um, sort of connected to, to, to Indian music and food. Um, but we were at the top of this, I was at the top of the house and, my, and there were bars on the window so I wouldn't fall out and she would put on the record player at the bottom of the house and it would kind of drift up the stairs and she'd put on the same record every night. She put on Mike Oldfield, Tubi Labelle's The First Side. And and I knew about the movie The Exorcist because I'd heard their <laughs> parents talking about it. I mean, this sounds terrifying. Yeah, I heard about <laughs> I knew that this was the soundtrack to a really scary film. Shall I put Tubular Bells on for you? And I'm like, shall I put on The Exorcist? <laughs> yes, please. But it was, it is a beautiful piece of music, but it had an associate, it has an eeriness, it has a tension, it has a cinematic mood and obviously even the even that amazing album cover you know it's the the ocean it's the unknown so uh, it did speak to me on a deep level and it and it, and every night it went on it was a journey and i i think i would i would tend to listen to the whole thing and then fall asleep if you had to pinpoint the emotion what would it have been if i had to pinpoint the emotional what the emotion what would it have been um, well, I think like most people, childhood is a mixture of, you know, uh, joy and, and despair, <laughs> you know, because, um, you're, you're, you are pretty lost and confused. And, uh, I, I had, I had both, both wheels rolling at the same time. I had a, I had a, on one level, I had a loving family and on, on another level, I had a family that was completely broken. And um, so, you know, it's like very mixed messages, you know, uh, so much of childhood is confusing because you're full of the joy of life and yet you're very sensitive to what's around you. And kids know that you know, people, people are struggling. So um, it was, it was, it was those kind of twin emotions of, of um, being, you know, uplifted and inspired and, in, in that melancholy that, that that record has. You, you mentioned that, you know, that it was your mum that put that record on downstairs. Um, tell us a little bit about those those early years. And, um, and what I want to know is, like, aside from that, was it was it a musical house? Was was there always records on, or was the radio on? And 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 secondly, I'm gonna uh, I'll add the question: Was was you always encouraged to? to be creative. I was encouraged. Yes, I was up to a point. Um, where, you know, when in the in the sort of mid late 70s, um, there were a lot of actors who used to come around at the weekend, uh, you know, actors who weren't working. Most actors aren't working. But these ones were working maybe in the week. And uh, there was guitars around and um, my grandfather was a great piano player, really. He played great kind of bluesy jazz and I uh, used to love listening to him. But, but I was encouraged to a point, I remember there was an electric guitar and an amp in one of the rooms and I decided to plug it in and start making a racket. I was about five. And the actor Rob Lindsay came in with some of the other adults. And at that time, Rob Lindsay was famous for playing Sisters and Smith, you know, power to the people. And he, he came and he's a very funny guy. And he came in and as, as the grown-ups came in the room, somebody just flicked the amp off, and just took the guitar away. And he looked, <laughs> and he looked, he looked at me and he said, it happens. <laughs> it happens a lot. Yeah. How, how was that sort of time? And, and when you'd go and sort of see your friends at school, did you realise that, you know, having Robert Lindsay Rand on a Saturday probably wasn't happening in your friends' houses? And, like, did, did you feel that you had something 
you know, very different going on at home to, to maybe classmates? Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, but I didn't, you know, um, I didn't really brag about it much. Um, I did know a guy down the road who's, whose dad worked at Pinewood Studios or somewhere like that. And he was in the props department or something. And him, he, he went in one weekend with his, with his two kids while Disney were making a movie called The Black Hole. Which was like two thousand and one for kids it was very. That, that was there. That was Disney's go at Star Wars, wasn't it? Trying to kind of replicate Star Wars, if I remember rightly. Yeah, I think it was like it was, but it was also like a bad acid trip, you know. So it was, it was <laughs> like I, I guess they sold it to the to the uh, to the executives as, hey, we're going to do Star Wars, but secretly the 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 writers were like, we're going to do two thousand and one for kids, <laughs> and it, you know, it, but there are robots in it, and there's there was one called Maximilian. And and, mm. and um and they're quite scary, uh, intimidating looking robots. And they these kids with their dad had gone in the prop department and they'd had pictures taken of them with the robots. And he went no into way. school with this he went into school with those pictures and and everyone uh, yeah, it was a bit of a bit it's a bit you gotta be careful you don't just sort of get get seen as a show off and bragging. Yeah. Somebody says, Yeah, that's really cool and then <laughs> punches you in the face. <laughs> Shame he's not here now, that robot. Um, I'm going to ask you for, for, for track three to tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school, please. Yeah, what was that? I, I had thought it through. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the, I, I changed schools quite a few times, actually, because um, my, my family were moving around. And... Um, but if there's a if there's a song that that for me really connects me to the past it, it's it's when when i started playing guitar and when i started to have a sense of se a sense of my own independence which i felt through being able to play music and my my elder cousin he he turned me on to 60s garage music he turned me on to the pebbles albums which were compilations of all these sort of proto-punk bands basically from Austin, you know, and, and, uh, you know, some, some, you know, little farm town outside of Arizona. And they all had these guitars that you could buy really cheap in the local supermarket and fuzz pedals. And they would turn the reverb up full and they'd record really, really badly, um, uh, sort of produced records, but they had this amazing character and they had all this teen energy and um and it's a it's a cult now you know 60s garage it really, and uh, and there was one song you know that's they're so easy to play that's what i remember about them there's a three or four chords and you could play along with these tracks and learn them and learn the harmonica parts and uh, what you know and we used to play them you know when we were hanging out me and my me and my other muso mates and there was a band called the haunted which is one of the classics one two five so uh, which is actually quite hard to get hold of now. It's a great record. It's just like, one, you know, that if you know about 60s, then this is like Beethoven and, and Mozart. And like, these are like the, these are the classic standards. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's fun that it's still, you know, a little bit, it's not so uh, popular, so not so widely known still. Did you enjoy school? No. Why not? It was the worst time of my life, without a doubt. It was, in, it was, a, it was prison. It's funny. There's a, one. Of my favorite movie about school is is If, because I did do, I did a couple of stints in a boarding school. Um, um, at one point, my, I was so sort of upset at home for various reasons that I actually asked to be sent to boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> wow. which is not 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 normally what you do but someone i know had gone and my mum you know i don't think it was cheap and i think she at the time was struggling a bit but she agreed i think she borrowed some money to send me there and um and i and i when i first went to boarding school i had a couple of years at this place and i was quite happy i was quite happy because i was so busy and there was so much to do and there's so many activities and I, I found out I could sing and I found out I could swim and I found out there were other things to do other than maths, which I was so bad at. Um, 
and then and this school ironically the place where I, the one place i was happy um later discovered that the headmaster been, had been running a paedophile ring and uh went to bed much too uh, sorry went to bed sorry that's a Freudian slip he went to jail much too late uh and it's a it's a shocking story you know but that's the the perks of the private school system um apart from the apart from those two years uh i just felt i think because i wasn't academic i just felt useless and that's the worst thing a, a kid should feel is worthless and useless mm -hmm. but that was the pre 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 presiding sort of feeling of being at school until i found music and then music was my um reason to live you know that was my purpose was that and, encouraged at school um the choir i was singing in the choir i used to like singing in the choir some great pieces of music you learn about harmony um but after the choir so after the no only between 10 and 12 was i encouraged and that was in the choir and then apart before that it was it was all it was a it was pretty much a disaster did you have any idea when you was at school what you wanted to be well i don't think i was being particularly imaginative at the time but i thought i might might be an actor <laughs> because I had a lot of actors in my family and I thought, well, that looks like fun. And, and I used to say, oh, I think I'll be an actor. And they'd all say, no, don't be an actor, please don't. You never, no one ever works. Everyone's un unemployed the whole time. They're always waiting for the phone to ring. They're constantly about to jump off a ledge because they think, you know, their career's over. Actors are, actors are, you know, very, uh, shall we say, highly strung. So I, I think I was just saying it because I, I felt I understood what they were doing as actors. They live, they live through other characters. They, they, they have something missing in themselves, right? Which is like their gift because then they are able to fill themselves up with these other characters and make it seem real. And so, you know, to be an actor, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a curse actually, a bit like a comedian, stand up comedian, you know, they have something missing. <laughs> They need to be making people laugh and that and that's part of the gift you know um uh, not all the time but most of the time you said that um when you was at boarding school and you, you, you realized you could sing and you enjoyed the choir and and then obviously you know fast forward into you know to the 90s to now you know you've you've walked on stages in front of ridiculously big crowds and what i want to ask you is like back then uh, when you found your voice and you you know and you would be in the choir was you, was you a confident young lad uh i i think i'm sort of a mixture of being um of being a uh, sort of you know i think to 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 do to do to play music and to to perform if you want to give it that word uh, some some people need a, an ego you know a, a very strong ego um but I think the, the the healthy version of that is that you just really want to do it. You know, you just really want to play music. You're in love with music. You're obsessed with it, and and that that is what really um, gets you over the humps that uh, you have to deal with in terms of um, you know not just your own um, doubts doubts of should I be doing this and is it even going to work and am I any good and all that but also just the challenges of um, you know it, it's not quick or easy to create a, a career it's not you know lucky breaks are lucky they're, they're rare and they, they happen you know because of other kind of divine forces yeah. um, so so you know I, and i've worked with people as well who, who like you know who want to write a book or something and it's you know there's so there's so many things that hold you back and you just have to be that passion is actually what propels you through it you, know, you just got to really love doing it and want to do it want to do it more than anything else i'll ask you for track four to tell me about the first song you bought from a record shop please the first song Yes, the first song I bought was um, 
the first song was a single and it was in Woolworths in Kingston. I think I was, I don't know, nine, eight or nine. I went and bought the single of Stand and Deliver by Adam Ant. And uh, yeah, I think that was the first time I remember someone was on TV at the weekend. And then when you went in in the morning, all the kids in the in the playground before lessons are all talking about Adam Ant. They'd all seen him do, uh, I think it was a Royal Variety performance or something like that. It was like one of those big event, event TV, you know, you know Max Bygraves and uh, um, all sorts of people. Russ Abbott was there. And then um, uh, Adam Ant came on, I think, did Ant music and, uh, and everyone was talking about it. I don't know and if you remember Rightly that. so. Right, yeah, it was so. it was so cool. It was so cool. It was punk. It was like punk for kids, yeah. you know. And and it, but it wasn't like watered down. It was just really arty and really. And he was he was a good looking guy, and everyone loved it. And we were all like, "Yeah, did you see Adam Ant?" So um, when this next single came out, um, yeah, I went I went and got it. It was exciting, and um, and those those records, they they they. They don't sound nice. They're, they're not sonically, you know, um, sort of, they're not, uh, they're not gentlemen. They're, they're scra scruffy and scrappy and they come, they come bl bl blaring out the speakers. There's, there's, there's a lot of nasty frequencies in there mm. and a lot of ideas, great ideas. And it's fun. It's, it's fun. I, years later, I got to work with um, uh, a, 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 a stylist called uh, Joe Cora who who did all the adamant um styling she worked with him and she and she's a she's a, a friend now and she, she she all of her outfits were then put on exhibition at the vna and she took her mom and you know it was a great day but she said you know they were just trying ideas out and there was a lot of spontaneity and he was thinking i want to be i want to be this character i want to play a character and they were just there was a there was a certain amount of calculation in terms of we want to we want to make this something special, but there was also, they were just trying it out as they went, you know, and uh, that's, that's so, so great when, when uh, that happens in pop music, that is what pop music's all about. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we, we were born just a couple of months apart, uh, Christian, so um, lots of the kind of sort of references that you're saying yeah. completely resonating and, um, and, 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 adamant for sure and, and you know just looking into your song picks today i just pulled up the cover of stand and deliver and he just looks incredible like the cover art of, of that seven inch single is absolutely phenomenal and, and I, I stuck it on again i actually got to see adamant live last year and he was still superb and um and and in regards to intros just hearing them kind of horses gallop yeah, and then just him saying "stand deliver," and then first line on the dandy highway man. What an opening line as well! And it's just yeah. such a great pop single. And and I think back at that point, like when, when you see Adam and the Ants, I'm a big fan of like bands that look like gangs and like and they just look like a, a firm. And it was like and and that you had that with Madness then, and you had that with the Specials. They just looked like yeah. gangs, and it was yeah. like it was just. A, I, I think you know. I'm one of the people that loves to go back and watch old Top of the Pops and 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 seeing that that kind of period of music. Like it was that's without touching on Culture Club and Duran Duran. It's an amazing time for pop music. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um and 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 for me, the other thing that I love about um those kinds of uh, performers and bands is that they are very serious about their look. They're really into it, but they don't take themselves seriously. And there's a there's always that he, that humor, and um, that is seriously lacking these days. You know, everything's very earnest uh, or up its own ass. And I I just th those guys, um, you know, it's a tradition in pop music that you you slightly, you know, there's a wink and a smile, and he he had that for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, let's talk about clubbing, and uh, and I'm going to ask you for, for track five to tell me the song that soundtrack your yeah. years clubbing. 
Listen, I've got to, I've got to fess up. I wasn't much of a presence in Ibiza. <laughs> Do you know what, Kismith? <laughs> I've done 520 episodes of this podcast and I've interviewed so many musicians and actors and yeah. every single person goes, yeah, I wasn't really a big clubber. <laughs> and I think everybody just seemed to be caught up doing what they were doing and clubbing seemed to just kind of be parked up elsewhere or they were just in kind of little dive bars or indie clubs. Uh, everybody... Um was exposed to club culture well i think just before it all really happened at the end of the 80s or late 80s i was just i was still a kid i was playing guitar um i was discovering the 60s i was becoming a real 60s you know obsessive <clears throat> and there was a guy out near the school who used to talk about now nah, what you want to let get into his house music. I said, what's house music? And he'd go, yeah, house music. You check it out. You go and listen to house music. And I'd say to some kid who was a, like into skateboard and thrash, I said, what? He's a bit older than me. I said, what's house music? He went, it's sh shit is what it is. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. So I didn't really look into it. But, but then, but then something happened and, and it, I got to say it was an I think it was a really exciting time when when dance music and and the uh recreational drug culture and p political kind of anarch anarchic kind of attitudes to do with dis distrust of authority and bands and the 60s and nostalgia all kind of like came together just sort of after the beanfield uh, debacle you know where the where the, uh, the government police sent in and just sort of beat up all the travelers and smashed up all their vans and said you can't be a traveler anymore and 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 everybody kind of like just said these guys are these guys are assholes and all these raves started to happen and and it was like a big story and I just found that um, it was, it felt dangerous, you know, it felt like it, you know, the, the news, newspapers were down on it and the adults were down on it and that felt really good, you know, um, and that there's obviously people are just wanting to break out and just go and I don't, you know, I think there was a political element to it, but I think there was a lot of people who just wanted to let their hair down and um and even if you were just going to a club you know at the back of a pub you know or some sort of back room at a student union or you know at a gig or something there, there was still this mood that dance and bands and fashion and drugs and politics was all crossing over and um it's quite a complicated heady heady blend and uh, you know, I I, don't, I wouldn't say I, I was able to sort of like separate it and all and really understand all of it, but it was it was an exciting time, and um, I just remember, you know, it was around the time I was starting to go out on my own with my cousin and and hang out, you know, like when I was sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, you know, and starting to have that freedom, come home late, go to a pub, order a drink, just about get away with it. And um, this song by Pop Will Eat Itself was everywhere, everywhere. And I have lots of memories of seeing people dancing to it. And, and, and this, the fact that it had a kind of a weird sort of anarchic political kind of message. And yet it was the chorus was Big Mac Vice to go. It was like, it's the end of the world. Give me a Big Mac. I mean, <laughs> and I, I loved, I had heard Pop Will Eat Itself had done a song called Gribo Guru as well which i thought was an, an amazing title so i think this this song for me kind of sums up that period it was it was everywhere and um there's a few contenders you know stone roses would be one happy mondays you know obviously a few but but this this is the one that i remember this is the the soundtrack to snake bite and black and half an e <laughs> do you know what like I it's a cracking track and like I, I i don't think 
Pop will eat itself. Like so many of them bands, not, I'm not including the Roses and the Mondays in that, but lots of other bands that that come in, in that era have kind of been forgotten about um, because it, it, it seems so much of, of when, you know, documentaries are made about movements in music, it goes from Manchester straight to grunge and then to Britpop. And, and and that kind of bit in between with your poppies and Carter and stuffies and EMF and all of them, it kind of gets overlooked. And, uh, and and within them times, you know, EMF and GTS have been number ones in America. They were, you know, having huge success. But I think poppies, that whole kind of crossover scene of like that sort of indie wild guitar with all them kind of electronic, poppies, I think, really started that. And they started that 87, 88, like before you know, the, yeah. the, the rest of them bands happen. And it's, the production on that record still sounds huge. And like them sort of thundering little drum rolls when it kicks in at the beginning. It's a, it's a real yeah. cool arms, that track. And uh, it is, it is. That's a great way of putting it. And it, and it also, it, it's signaling like we listen to the, you know, we listen to the Stooges, you know, we're into it there. It's, it's that, that, that uh, tradition, you know, of, yeah. of, um, of rock and roll absolutely and I, I know you work with the prodigy and i think i think the poppies did as well um yeah they they, they worked because i think you could hear when you, you listen to you know those early pop beliefs because you can you can hear that the prodigy have drawn from that you know you know there was there was you know the whole sample culture as well they were on that early and uh and yeah and obviously clint mansell's gone on to have huge success uh you know as, as scoring films and such but um you, we, we spoke about your, you know, confidence and relationship with confidence uh, earlier, Crispian. You, you've chose a career in, you know, in, in, in music, which is famously one of the most toughest, uh, you know, places to try and, you know, sustain and, you know, and, 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 and manage a career, and you've done that. Um, how driven are you? Uh, no, I don't have a driver. Um, sorry, that was low. Um, it was, it was, um, yeah. How driven am I? Well, I'm definitely, I'm definitely driven, um, in terms of, uh, getting stuff done. But like I said, you know, you, you want to be driven by the, the excitement you have for the, the, the the music, you know, sure. or what, whatever it is that you're trying to do, make a film or whatever. You, it's that, it's that, it's that desire to see it come to life or to see it manifest itself. You know, uh, that that has to be a, an obsession. And I think if if you a healthy way is when is when because it's like you know allowing it, uh, yourself to just sort of. Uh, be yourself really it's self, it is self-expression and and it, you're just letting letting something grow naturally i think that you know there have been times in the past where i've been driven by anxiety you know or or fear and 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 sometimes you know if you're if you a lot a lot of people get get if they're very very ambitious part of their ambition is they're trying to suffocate they're trying to douse a certain anxiety that they that they carry around with them for whatever reasons i don't and i'm not sigmund freud but it's of you know some kind of trauma or loneliness or whatever and so that tends to become unhealthy <laughs> that that will not that will not take you into a good place even if you are successful you probably probably won't last very long and relationships will all be a mess so uh, yeah i think you know the uh, the drive has to come from a healthy place and i've certainly spent time making sure that um it's uh, it's not coming from that negative stuff i'm gonna ask you for track six to tell me a favorite song from an artist from your home county please you know um i'm i live near winchester and andover and really the only p people of real note from winchester and andover was well, the trogs and um i know everyone's heard the trogs and i was thinking it's got to be someone else it's got to be someone else apart from the trogs i i i'd like to find some surprises 
personally. So I opened it up to Hampshire and I found out that Mike Batt, he's from Southampton. And, um, you know, I was looking into his work, you know, because he's been so prolific and he's such a sort of a mad English genius. And the, the thing, the first thing I heard of his that really affected me deeply, a bit like tubular bells, was the music to Watership Down. Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah, right. This is so this is like childhood trauma stuff. Anybody who's seen Watership Down under the age of eight, you know, will never will never be able to sleep go to sleep before seeing, you know, the general biting the throats of all those other rabbits. And you know, this is a horror. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's a complete nightmare. I've traumatized my kids and shown it to them. And it has that, it has that very, very be beautiful, soulful kind of like pa pastoral theme. Da, 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 da. But then it's coated in, in danger. You know, that however beautiful, the countryside is there's always some bastard ready to run you over or shoot you or tear your throat out and so the whole thing has a real tension and and i i often drive past watership down where i am and i always say to the kids oh look it's watership down they go yes dad you know that's my my running dad joke i think that's watership down over there and we've climbed it a few times and um apart from watership down he also did Mike Batt did an amazing um, sort of psychedelic opus called the Tarot Suite, full of sort of, you know, different sort of uh, chapter two, the magician, you know, and things like that, a bit War of the Worlds um, with the narrator and stuff. And, and the, the opening uh, introduction to the Tarot Suite, which is the fool, the fool is the first card of the tarot, is complete, is batshit crazy. And um, it has a crazy, some crazy guitar in it. You, it. you never know where it's going. It just keeps mutating. I think, I think Slash actually covered it on an album somewhere. Really? I think, yeah, he's got done a cover of this. Um, strings are amazing. Strings are amazing. The guitar's amazing. All these weird t time changes. It's a little insight into a sort of very eccentric British composer who had a sort of a pop music crossover and also went went a bit psychedelic, you yeah. know, uh, maybe quietly psychedelic, but you realize he's and, and mystical. He's clearly into he's into, you know, different sort of mystic. Um, he's certainly into tarot. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's made he all on this it. podcast um, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and when he come on, I, I don't know what memo he got, but he yeah. was sitting at his piano and all of his song choices, he just played and sung them. It was wonderful. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh, he's, he's kind of the establishment now. You know, he's probably a Freemason, you know, him and Richard Stilgo and, you know, Rick Waitman. <laughs> But, but, you know, once upon a time, he was right there at the edges of, of weirdness. And um, this is a good, a good representation of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, look, it's your last track, uh, Crispin. I'm going to uh, ask you to tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to go and listen to, please. <clears throat> yeah, this is a, this is a, is this a nice uh, question to ask actually because because <clears throat> i think discovering music is one of the one of the joys um of, of listening and 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 i always value friends who have a, a great depth of musical knowledge and curate uh, compilation tapes and things like that um are you referencing that metaler that gave you smoke on the wall again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I worked for a time with a DJ called Mark Pritchard, and um, he he's a he's a he's a mate. Him and his him and his friend Dave Brinkworth. They used to have a little studio that they ran out the back of Jethro Tull's studio down in Devon, and. Uh, mm -hmm. It, because they're DJs, they just had an, an amazing record collection. There's so much um, 
you know, DJs often do have sort of a, a library going on. You know, everything like I've got this Isaac Hayes record because this hi hat on this track is brilliant, and I'm going to yeah. steal it. <laughs> and and a lot of jazz records and stuff from the '60s. And a lot, a lot of fun working with him. But this one, uh, I'm sharing this one because we, we, uh, Kula Shaker, you know, became pretty famous. Uh, one of the tracks that we became famous for was was obviously Tatva and also Govinda. And Govinda, you know, is a is a is a is the name of Krishna, and it's a chant, you know, that goes back to the dawn of time. And you know, it really it belongs to the it belongs to to uh, the world, you know, it's it goes back so far. And we always sang that song um, with a lot of uh, love and respect. And it was always very, very lucky for us as well. It really did, really did protect us and, and bring us a lot of um, good fortune. And I don't mean just sort of that. I mean, I mean, ha you know, happiness and there's there's actually quite a few songs with um, the name Govinda in it. And the, the first time I ever heard it was a, an album that George Harrison produced in 1969, I think, for Apple. I think it was one of the first Apple recordings. And it was the uh, the Krishna temple, the Hare Krishna temple that they that was being set up in London was basically lots of kids who'd kind of dropped out of university and were living as monks and were doing all this, you know, uh, congregational chanting and George was hanging out with them and, and they hadn't, they were trying to get a temple together and he invited them to live at his house. And John Lennon said, Oh, you come and live. You, you guys can also live at my mansion in Tittenhurst, you know? So these, these, these kids who were living as monks were hanging out with the Beatles. And I met one who, who had, you know, been living at that time. He said it was really, really wild and very interesting time to be, be to be living a renounced life, whilst living with the most famous people in the world. And um, George decided to make a record with them to make some money for their temple, and he produced the sacred chants with them it's called the Radha Krishna Temple album and it was released on Apple and they had two singles <laughs> both of which were on top of the pops so I you know people said oh Kool Shake has not been done before well actually we are just in that line coming from from this these people and the second single they released was called Govinda and it was a different it's a different chant it's a, actually a sort of a prayer from a from a scripture called the brahma samhita you know which is like again from the dawn of time but it's really beautiful and you can hear george's production and his slide all over it and it's just it's it reminds me of um you know like those rotary connection albums and mini ripperton and uh a little bit of ananda shankar as well you know just it, it, it becomes sort of ecstatic and 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 uh, builds to an incredible crescendo. And a lot of people don't know it. And um, I'm happy to turn them on. Here it is. Wonderful. Well, Chris, can we put together a Spotify playlist of all of the tracks that we've spoken about? Okay. Today, so people can go and explore um, everything that we've uh, we've chatted about today. And obviously, um, I'll put Kuli Shaka Records on that as well. Um, recent single waves as well um so tell us a little bit about what people can expect from from the new record as well well we've we, we've been on a on a kind of a, a a pattern over the last 10 12 years of maybe more actually of of only putting a record out every four years um we were having families and kids and um, doing other jobs as well. I was I was making films and uh, Alonso was producing and it, it was Paul was playing with other people and it, it, it just became like, well, we're every three or four years we get together, we write some songs and make a really good album. We'll do some touring and then we'll go back to this other double life. And then after the um, the lock up, uh years i mean lockdown lock up as i prefer to call it the 
the idea of um, getting some momentum came up because we made congregational um, uh, first congregational church, which was an album we're really proud of, but we, we, we wanted to keep writing. We had more songs to go. That's why it was a double album. And then we had a, a, a scheduling thing with a problem with our, with our keyboard player who couldn't do some dates. And Jay Darlington came back, who played with us in the beginning, and he finished working with the Gallagher brothers. So then Jay was back. We had the, we were, it, it was like going back to the early, early days. And we were kind of conjured up that, that chemistry was still there. So we, we started writing a lot quick. We went straight back in the studio and, and it was like, oh, there's another record. So we're going to do another record now. And it's, you know, a year cycle, which is sort of much more old school, you know, than the, the big sort of stodgy Pink Floyd. <laughs> Let's wait four years. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it is a little bit more uh, get up and go. It's a little bit more another great track, get, get up and go by the Ruttles. Yeah, but um, it's a bit more two, 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 two minutes, 30, three minute tops, you know, get in, get out. It's, it's exciting actually to, to try and, um, and put songs together with that kind of discipline and economy. And, and we did it back in the day. So it's, it's quite nice to come full circle. And you say it was lovely to, you know, when, when Joe joined again to, to, you know, to have that original sort of chemistry and stuff, but, how is it now, you know, just being in the studio together? Is, I take it there's a lot less pressure now than, than what there was, you know, maybe in the, you know, the 90s when, you know, you've got big label pressure trying to sort of, you know, squeeze everything from you. Does it feel as, as, as obviously you're, you're older now, does it just feel, and you're more grounded, I guess, in, in all your, you know, you say you've got families and that now, is it just a, a kind of more relaxed and, and comfortable sort of place to, to, to write and create now? Depends what day you go in the studio. Okay. Uh, yeah, depends. I, I, we're we're still we're still very ambitious, um, and it's not like uh, oh we want to be we never got to play Wembley. Let's go back and play Wembley. It's much more like we know we know we can we can play at that level, and and uh, so you're always pushing yourself to be the best you know you can be yeah uh, and, and it helps you I mean, if you if you lose that really it, it, it does get tired and stodgy and it becomes just you may as well just sort of play at the weekends yeah there has to be a hunger a hunger is really healthy a hunger to 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 surprise yourself and to to just keep getting better um uh, there was a documentary uh which i watched recently about king crimson and i, th I think robert fripp said Somebody said, you know, why are you still playing? And he said, you know, I think I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and uh, you, you, you have to feel that. You, you have to. If you don't, then uh, definitely I would stop. Yeah. September 4th, 100 Club, live. Looking forward to that? This was not my idea. <laughs> we're, go we're going on tour. We're going, we're going back to tour America and we're going to be doing, um, you know, we're going to be doing clubs basically. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. It's going to be down and dirty, but, uh, we haven't played in England since January. So they just wanted to just freshen up and play a gig before we, before we go off. Wonderful. I haven't played there for years. I don't know. I'm sure it's great fun to be in the crowd. <laughs> it's bloody noisy it's a bloody noisy space and the record comes out early next year um the the record well i think we've got two more singles to come out and then okay. and then there's going to be a record in uh, the, the album's going in january i think yeah fantastic um if people want to find out everything that's going on with the cooler shaker whether it be releases tour dates where, where's the best place to for everybody to sort of find out about that i think um you uh you go onto this thing called the the tinternet and you, 
Tell me tap, more. tap, and cool shake are into Tintranet, and it'll come up uh, all sorts of info. I think you just uh, go to coolshaker I think. Fantastic. Fantastic. I've not checked it out, but I've heard it's quite helpful. <laughs> or .co .uk even. Fantastic. Christian, thanks so much for your time today. It's been really, really lovely talking records with you, mate. Thank you. All right, pleasure. Thanks, Stu. Uh, I'm going to press well. stop. Okay, go bye. Don't go anywhere. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Uh, let's press stop on